This is Support is Sexy, episode 49, with Miss Now Mrs.com CEO, Danielle Tate. Welcome to the Support is Sexy podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I am happy to have you here because you know it just would not be the same without you. So today we are welcoming Miss Danielle Tate. And Danielle is the founder of the multi-million dollar name change company called Miss Now Mrs.com. And in a nutshell, the company helps to significantly reduce the process of changing your name after you get married. And Danielle talks about recognizing after her own experience with this, that there was an opportunity there. And more than that, she also goes into how failure at different times throughout your journey as an entrepreneur can be an opportunity. And I thought that was a really powerful message. And another great thing she did was write a book called Elegant Entrepreneur, The Female Founder's Guide to Starting and Growing Your First Company. Because again, there was another opportunity there that she saw where she was as a woman in her 20s who didn't have a background in business or an MBA. She felt there weren't any guides, very straightforward guides, especially targeting women and talking about not only the how-to of growing your business, but also the experience of growing your business. So in this episode, Danielle talks to us about three tips for women on how to research your target market, insider tips on how to grow your business, also how to protect yourself from copycats, which was great advice, the importance of meetups and authentic connections, why you need to slow down. Also, Danielle says, she who dares wins. Now, before we get into the episode, I want to tell you about something that I'm very excited about. An offer for Support is Sexy listeners. If you go to elainefluker.com slash free, you will see there our program, 90 Days to Next Level. And the reason that I'm offering this from September 15th to December 15th of this year is because I've been having conversations with people who have been asking me for some kind of program, coaching, consultation, support. Support is my thing, in case you didn't know. Wanted to set up something for this year that people can have access to. It's going to be a very small, intimate group, only 10 slots, as a matter of fact, because I wanted to have an environment where we can all really support each other. So in this group, you'll get access to other women entrepreneurs, resources, one-on-one conversations and coaching sessions with me, weekly group calls, access to our private Facebook group, and so much more. There will be so many resources and just things. The whole idea is to give you things to help set you up for a powerful next year. We want you to strut into 2017 powerfully. So go to elainefluker.com slash free because you'll get a free 30-minute consultation with me and we will talk about if you feel the program is right for you or not. But either way, I would love to connect with you. I would love for some of you to take advantage of this and to be able to support yourself and each other moving forward. So now get ready to take note because I know you're going to get a lot of jewels from this episode. Without further ado, Danielle Tate. So Danielle, thank you so much for joining us on an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm excited to finally chat with you. Me too. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So the first question I ask everyone is when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? So I have to be very honest here. Um, I started a company almost a decade ago. And so it would be appropriate to say 10 years ago, I fell in love with entrepreneurship. But it took me about a year of, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing. What am I doing? Is this is this working? To really understand that, yes, I am an entrepreneur. And I love this. And I love the freedom and the ability to take ideas and make them happen. So nine years ago is the short answer. Nine years ago. So what was it in that moment that made you finally say, yes, this is something that I'd love to do? You know, I had put a lot of time and research and money into launching my first company. And I have zero business background. So while I was as prepared as I could be, it felt very risky. And um, within 30 minutes of turning on the website and Google ads, we had our first customer. And within the first couple of weeks, I realized, you know what? I don't have to go 
you know, dress up and go to an office nine to five and drive all over the place to bring in an income. And I experienced the flexibility of like, oh, I'm going to go have lunch with my mom and I'm going to do this. And so that's when I really realized this is absolutely the right lifestyle for me. Right. You were like, this works for me. Absolutely. Oh, good. Now, where did you grow up? In Pennsylvania, right? Yes. I'm from a tiny town called Bedford, which right. is exit 11 on the turnpike. It's that small when you use that to describe your town. <laughs> That's such an, uh, a northerner thing. We also, well, what exit is it off the turnpike? Then you have a sense, a sense of exactly where it is. I totally got it. What was Danielle like as a child? I am told that I was incredibly precocious. Mm -hmm. uh, I never stopped talking. I was big into horseback riding and Girl Scouts. And um, I think one of my more interesting claims to fame is I graduated high school a year early. Mm. Now, who were some of your greatest influences growing up? You know, I have an incredible uh, steel magnolia southern grandma, uh -huh. and um, she wore red everywhere, and actually uh, she passed prior to my book being published, so the red dress on the cover is in homage to her. Oh. And she was one of those ladies who was like, you can do anything if you work hard enough and believe it will happen. And so she'd had her own businesses, traveled the world, and was really very supportive of anything any of us grandkids were, were into. I love that. Now, you received your BA in biology from Western Maryland. I think that's what it was called then. It's called something else now. Yes, it's McDaniel now. <laughs> yes, McDaniel. I saw that somewhere. I couldn't find it again. Uh, so what was your career plan in studying biology? You wanted to be, was it a cardiologist? Yes, I had intended to be a cardiologist for the first 20 odd years of my life and did you know all the right things, all of the internships, all of the summer activities to, to do that. And when I missed medical school by three seats, I was a little bit devastated. Um, it was one of my big, big fails early on, and mm. I sort of scraped myself back up and took the first job available selling Canon copiers. What does that mean? You missed it by three seats. There were there were a certain number of spots. There left. were a certain number of spots that oh. I went to, like final interviews. I had, like found my apartment and tentative roommates in Texas down at Baylor. And um, when I got the call, I realized that the entire roadmap I had made for myself had just disappeared and I had to figure out what was next. How did you figure it out in that moment, especially at that time being so young? Because you had graduated early, so I assume you were a little younger than the average person going into yes. school. How did you, what was um, that like? It was, it was one of those, you know, have a good cry and right. take a deep breath. And I realized while I love my hometown, I had no desire to go home and live in my parents' home again, although they're wonderful. And, you know, in such a small town, I didn't want to go home as a failure either. Mm. So what that meant graduating into a recession was find a job and find a job fast to be able to pay for an apartment out of college. And so that's how I ended up in sales. And I found out that I love selling things and interacting with people, just not particularly copiers. Right. <laughs> now, when you went for that um, copier job, you had to sort of prove your grit from what I've seen in research to the person who was hiring you, right? What's that? Tell us that story. So there I am, young Danielle Rollette in my first suit, sitting across this huge <laughs> desk from this gentleman. And there was no red dress then. Right? <laughs> there was no red dress then. I was very conservative. I think it was like navy and a collared white right. shirt. I still remember it was actually pretty tragic. <laughs> and... um. <laughs> This man, Steve, looks at me and he reads my, my resume and, you know, it's showing all of these internships at medical schools and, you know, all of these different things. And he's like, so what makes you think you have what it takes to sell copiers? Like, what, what do you think you're, do you think you're going to be able to, to deal with people telling you no and rejection? And um, I thought about my, my history and I thought about one of my particularly terrible internships and decided that sharing the story was worth the embarrassment because I really needed the job. And of course, that story is uh, in one of my internships, I was uh, learning, well, I wasn't learning, I was watching heart catheterizations being done. And so the only hands-on thing that interns were allowed to do was shaving groins on the inmate population. So I looked at this gentleman and said, well, you know, I've shaved over 300 inmates' groins in a summer, so I'm pretty sure I can do just about anything. Right. And he looked at me, like jaw dropped and said, well, you've got the job. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. I'm sure no one else came into the interview with that. No, probably not. <laughs> my poor mother didn't know that story until much later when it came out in press. <laughs> and she, was she like, oh, my God, did you really say that? Yeah, she was like, that happened? I had no idea that was your part of your internship. She was just mortified. 
<laughs> but it worked. And that's the thing. Sometimes you have to share that thing that you just don't know. You know, you might as well go for it kind of yep. thing. You got to own it. Understand the odds and, and take the risk. Love it. Now, you, as you said, you interviewed for that job and then you got the position. Now, as a salesperson, at what point did the entrepreneur bug sort of take hold? I know you talked about once you started, you very much felt it, but... So it was my second sales job. I was actually the number one sales rep for a Fortune 500 company. And um, that involved driving 1,300 miles a week. And I loved it. It was intense. I had just met um, my, my husband and got married. And I took a day out of all that insanity to change my name. And pretty put together, pretty organized, had all my forms. And it took me three trips to get my name on my driver's license, my new married name. And I was just so frustrated. I had wasted an entire day and it was just really stupid things that had caused the delays. And so I came home and, you know, stormed into my poor husband and was like, there should be something like TurboTax for name change. And he just took a minute and looked at me and was like, well, you should do that. So that was really the the spark, the impetus for the company that became Miss Now Mrs. Now tell us what Miss Now Mrs. does exactly, because it's a multi million dollar company now that you've built and you launched it 2006 yes very yeah. late 2006 late 2006 so now it's doing doing well and growing and so tell us about what it does how it works and sure so miss no misses is an online name change service for brides so traditionally if a woman gets married and decides to change her last name it takes 13 hours to file things with you know social security your passport your driver's license and then you notify your banks credit cards insurances this endless list what the service does is condenses that 13 hour process into 30 minutes for $30 wow very to the point you've got you definitely a salesperson <laughs> you've got it down <laughs> Now, when your husband told you you should do that, was there a part of you, though, that was like, well, how would I do that? Or why would I be the one to do that? Did you have any of those moments or did you jump right in? Oh, very much so. Um, it wasn't like the movies where it's like, oh, tomorrow I'm quitting my job and going to you know, hire 20 people and have this beautiful office. Um, the idea rattled around and germinated for a couple months. And then going back to the biology degree, I did my research. And so I looked and I'm like, well, how many marriages are there? There's 2.3 million in the U.S. annually. How many women change their name? It's actually 88% still, which was very surprising. So it was this huge renewable market that was experiencing the same problem I had. And so having that sort of data behind me helped me take the next steps to be like, okay, you know, what forms would I want to have completed? How would I go about doing that? So I, I literally called all 50 state DMVs uh, to understand their processes before launching the company. So, Oh my gosh, you were on hold for, one, for like six hours or something, correct? crazy, right? Jays. I think it totaled out when you totaled it all like three days of all time. Oh my gosh. And when you called them, were you asking them what kind of information did you, did you ask them what kind of forms you would need or? So I started, you know, everything you iterate on. So I think the first one I was like, Hey, you know, <laughs> what form is it? And they get told me and then I hung up and then I was like, Oh, I need to know the fees and I need to like understand what you file first. So I ended up making this little like questionnaire that I filled in and then I definitely had to pose as a bride from each of those different states and, you know, finesse things a little bit. But uh, it was it was an experience and it gave me um, the basis to become an expert in married name change and understand what the system needed to do. Do you think that um, research then was crucial to you preparing to launch the business? Absolutely. And I think it's it's crucial for anyone thinking about getting into business. Um, there are so many good ideas on paper, but if you never take the risk to make the phone calls and actually back up that good idea, of course you think it's a, a good idea and you have the problem, but ensuring that other people have that problem and it's a big enough market for you to make some money on um, is going to get you a long way. Now you went uh, to the DMV because there was this, an exact place where you're particular customer probably would have had to go to do whatever she had to do. For someone else starting another kind of business, what are some ways that you suggest um, that they can do the research? Is it asking your friends? Is it doing a survey of people? Is it emailing I, a list if you have one? I think all of those are great. Friends typically tell you what you want to hear because they're your friends, I and, um, <laughs> especially like super close friends. Um, if your idea or product or solution is targeting a sort of specific market, say, for example, runners, 
go to a marathon and be there and survey them, ask them the question. If you have a product, show them like the, the little thing that you've made and say, you know, do you have this problem? Would you buy this? How much would you charge? If it's a more general population, I have literally gone to Starbucks and offered to buy people's coffees to get them to answer my survey. And that's mm. how you get a really random sampling for, you know, three to five dollars a pop. So interesting. Um, what kind of sur- was that? Was that a survey for this particular business? It was. It was. What was that like? What did you do? You just said, hey, tell us. This- we want to hear a story. I need a Starbucks story. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know, you stand there and people are all waiting. And you're like, Good. excuse me, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm planning to start a company and I have this 10 question questionnaire if you would complete it I'd be happy to buy your coffee and um, people look at you like you're a little bit nuts and then they look at the survey and if you get one or two people to start filling it in then then you've got them other people right and then plus the fact that Starbucks is like six dollars now so I'd be like sure right I will fill out your they're survey. a captive audience they're stuck in line they can't actually get away from you <laughs> right they're not gonna leave <laughs> they're not gonna leave the line that's so that is smart I like that that's really good now would you say that um what has been crucial to your growth of the business? Because now I know you're at, is it 300,000 or more customers? Yeah, 300,000 customers, two countries, and ever growing and expanding. I would say the biggest component of that growth and continued growth is um, I'm a big fan of having a good idea daily. So it's like the mm. one big idea that launches the company, but you can't just launch it and then rest. You need to keep thinking about, you know, what can I do to make this better? What can I do to find more customers? And so some of the things that we've done to expand was um, look for mirror markets. So we have MissNowMrs.com. I serve brides trying to change their name. And um, this is a good story for you. My poor husband came home and I had Divorce for Dummies propped open on the couch and a glass of wine. And he was like, oh, my God, I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> I was like, yes, but not about getting divorced. I'm pretty sure it's the same process to go back to your maiden name. And so uh, launching Get Your Name Back took like a tenth of the effort of Miss Now Misses because – you know, we had all of the forms and all of the database built. It was literally, you know, repackaging it and messaging to divorcees. So look for a mirror market. Or um, another thing we did was look for strategic partners. When we were new, we're asking for things like your maiden name and your social security number. People don't want to give that out if they don't know you. So early partnerships with people like Wedding Wire and The Knot and David's Bridal gave us a lot of credibility and also got the word out about our brand. Now, a question, getyournameback.com, is that a new? Yes. Okay, I didn't know about that one. Very smart. When did you launch that? Let's see. That would have been 08. Oh, so very shortly after. We had enough brides or actually um, married women asking, hey, can you switch me back from Mrs. to Miss? That I was like, well, let me, you know, do the research again and, you know, dug up Divorce for Dummies. And it is very much a similar process. And then then the numbers, was it as big of a market? I'm scared to ask. No. (laughs) I no, don't want to I, I, ne- I never wish as much of a businesswoman as I am. I never wish to like double yeah. dip and have someone use Miss No Misses and then use Get Your Name Back, right. but it has happened. Um, it is a much smaller um, annual revenue than Miss No Misses. Um, sadly, the population that uses the internet to solve problems is aging into divorcee age range, so we are seeing a lift. Mm, interesting. Now, last year you released your book. Elegant Entrepreneur, which I love. The female, I want to get the the subtitle right. The Female Founder's Guide to Starting and Growing Your First Company. Now, this was sparked out of um, a feeling of a void for guides that really targeted women. Tell us about that. Sure. So... You know, if you had told me 10 years ago that I would be writing a book on entrepreneurship, uh, sans an MBA, I would have looked at you like you were crazy. But um, I feel like I've read almost every business book ever written and I've learned a lot, but I never found that one book that talked to me like a smart woman but didn't assume that I had an MBA. And that was used very simple language. Here's how you do it. Here are real tools. Here's how it feels at each of these different stages in building a business. And then here's inspiration from amazing female founders like Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank and Jenny Fleiss from Rent the Runway. So I kept waiting for someone much more famous than myself to write this book. And I think really famous people write memoirs because they're much more appealing. So again, ever the problem solved, I'm like, well, if no one else will write this book, I will. And I really hope that it inspires more smart women with ideas to actually leave corporate America and and start their own companies and be in charge of their whole lives. 
That's what Toni Morrison says. You have to write the book you want to read if no one else will write it. Now, what kind of things did you um, experience personally throughout your journey that you wanted to make sure to include in the book? Because you talked about those feelings, for example, during these different stages. So the feeling component was really important to me, and it seems to be something that's resonated really deeply with the readers. I think magazines and books, you know, they're meant to be inspirational. So they sort of gloss over like the hard times and the big emotions. So, you know, you look at Inc. and Fast Company and there's like people smiling in front of their, you know, multi-million dollar office building or Bentley or whatever. And they don't talk about the time where, you know, it was do you pay your mortgage or do you pay your staff? And so I wanted to dig into those emotions because I think they were a little bit of a barrier for me. And if I could have at least known they we're coming down the pike, I could have prepared a little bit better and transitioned through the steps of building a business much more smoothly. I always felt like I was sort of like scrambling and clawing and I'd like to make that a smoother transition for other women. Was there a time during your business where you didn't know, not necessarily the mortgage or your staff, but just one of those moments that you felt like either I don't know what I'm doing because I know a lot of us go through that. Was, I don't know where I'm doing or where do I get the help to figure this out or what do I need to move to the next step? So I think the all-time bottom for me in the business was um, a couple years into starting Miss Now Misses, we had a series of copycat lawsuits. And the first one took me really by surprise. I'm a nice Methodist girl from Pennsylvania. I figure you start your business, you work hard, you're honest, you know, you'll do well. And um, it came to my attention that another company had started and their logo looked almost exactly like my logo and their story was my story. And it turns out that the individual who was a gentleman who started the company had come through Miss Now Misses and logged in over 180 times uh-huh. so and mined all of the data. Research, yes, right. And so I had to decide, do I take the money coming in to fight this person and you know legally duke it out or do I just try to outmarket them? And it was really frustrating and scary, and I decided to fight. I needed more time for brand awareness and to finish locking up partnerships. And so I ended up eight months pregnant in federal court on the witness stand defending my company. I've been scared to death that I was like hurting my baby with the stress level, and that was a really hard time. And uh, they ended up ruling in our favor, and we moved forward from there. But that was a time where all of the energy that should have been going into the company, all the money that should have been going into you know, iterating and improving and marketing was being funneled into lawyer's fees. And I second-guessed myself a lot, but in the end, I made the right decision. Yeah, that's great. I'm so glad they ruled in your favor. Now, how, do you, how does one protect themselves against copycats? I mean, luckily for you, you had the research to see that, especially with an online business, that this person logged in hundreds of times and that kind of thing. But what can we do to protect ourselves? And I actually have a whole section about that in, in the, the book, book. That's right. <laughs> because that's something you don't always think about. Uh, so anyone that has a website where you would log in, um, there's, you should have terms and conditions uh, or ter- terms of use that you have. And they can be very simple, but do get a lawyer to write them for you. And within that terms of use say, you know, as a user, I pledge to not create the same type of thing for profit for myself. So I'm, I'm, that's, you know, you and me language, not how it actually is in legalese, but having that in place where they have to check um, has stood up in court. Another thing is think about what the most important or unique component of your business is. Like what, what is that thing? And for us, um, it was the processing, like the form processing database driven component. And so after a couple copy cat lawsuits, we ended up, duh, thinking of a way to protect that. So if you're a customer and you use our service and you go through more than three states, we freeze your account and a little pop-up says, hey, you might be confused about how to use our service. Give us a call in our 800 number. Mm. And if we talk and if it's a military bride or somebody who's moved all over, of course we turn their account back on. But if it's someone digging for information, they don't call and we've stopped them before they started. So I encourage entrepreneurs and businesswomen to think about what that component is and think of a clever way to protect it. Right. And I love that you, the phrasing of it from what you tell us is sort of, it's not, it's gentle, but it's saying, hey, we noticed that you're doing this. If everything's on the level, then it's fine. But if not, 
we noticed that you're doing this. Right. <laughs> yeah. If you're that bad person and, you know, right. in the, at night, like trying to dig out all the information, you're like, oh, well, they kind of are on to us. So, right. yeah. Exactly. So the, now the site that you, I mean, the, uh, you mentioned the document that you would have someone check off or something. Is that before they're able to actually view your site? Um, so no, you can go to Miss Now Misses, but um, as you are purchasing, you agree to that. Ah, okay. So ladies, if you're listening and I'm trying to find a boilerplate, you can borrow it, but please have it tweaked by a lawyer because it might not be perfect for you. You can copy paste the Miss Now Misses terms and conditions and at least look at them to get a sense of what you might want to put in your own terms of use. Yeah, that's great. Great advice. Now, one of the quotes that I love from your book, um, early on in the book, it says about the race to success is a misnomer. I'm reading my own handwriting here. <laughs> That's why I pause. I'm like, I want to make sure I get the phrase right. It says the race to success is a misnomer. Racing implies a reckless dash, whereas many of the most successful people in life have strategically plotted their trajectories. Entrepreneurial women don't have to rush through what they hold important in life, such as love and parenthood, to achieve their goal. So tell us the importance of slowing down. So there's another quote that's not in the book um, that I love. It's like, you know, know where you're going. Many people are going nowhere fast. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not very exciting sometimes, but to know, figure out exactly what you want in your life um, on, on the macro level. Like, you know what, like what you want right now, what you need to be successful in your company, what's successful for you in your personal life. And have those as end end goals, like sort of like connecting the dots. Those are your end dots. And look at you where you are now. And then think about logically what the steps are to get to those different places and start doing them. And so I've seen many friends, you know, take the huge jobs, put off put off having kids, put off relationships and are now doing IVF and all sorts of really hard things. And everybody makes the choices that are right for them. But I just want women to know that you really can have it all. Maybe not all at the same time, but don't limit yourself to the cookie cutter of what success was was sold to you as. Think about what success would mean to you on a personal level. I think that's so smart because as you said, we, we all have to make different sacrifices as we go along. But even speaking for myself, I know there's that part of me that's like, no, everything else has to stop. I have to focus on just this thing. And as you say, life goes on. And then later in life, you're looking back, like, oh, I should have done this at this point, or I could have, even if not should. I should, I could have done this as well as that. It didn't have to be all or nothing. Right. You should take opportunities like vitamins. You need a bunch of them. Like you don't want just one mm. because if that doesn't work out, you're, it's, it's good to have a lot going on. I love that. Opportunities like vitamins. I love that. Now, if there's one thing you wish you um, knew about entrepreneurship or that something that someone would have told you about it, what would that be? It's going to sound very simple. Um, I wish someone would have told me to sort of own my role as an entrepreneur sooner or later. I think because I didn't have a business background and because I was a woman in tech um, at a time when there weren't a lot of women in tech, I always sort of danced around the outside edge of entrepreneurship. And it wasn't until I finally owned it and was like, yes, I'm a female founder, I'm an entrepreneur, and started going to uh, entrepreneurial events in D.C. and all over where I met people like me. And when you meet other entrepreneurial friends, they understand what you're doing and they understand how busy you are and you sort of collaborate and share and help each other in ways that friends that you've had for a long time might not be able to just because they're living a very different life. Was that something that was crucial then to you, just building that community or getting involved in a community that was, like you said, like you or understood the same kinds of things? Because some of us become isolated in our business and think we just need to focus on that as opposed to reaching out to people who are. Yes. Yeah, so I did an outstanding job uh, creating a, a software company and um, small family in, in a vacuum. And it's, I think back, it's one of the, you know, you always second guess. I'm like, oh, if I had been plugged in the way I am now, then how much easier would this have been? Like how much less struggle would there have been in all these different points? So please learn from my mistake. And even though it's uncomfortable, especially when you're brand new to go to these events, it's sort of like, you know, finding a restaurant you like. There's lots of different things out there. There's meetups around everything known to mankind. There's lots of female founder things that you can plug into. Go to a couple. Not you know the first one you go to, you may not gel with everyone, but you will find a group of people that you like and click with, and you will be very grateful to have them. 
And one of the things I always try to remember and tell people to remember, too, is probably most of the people there are uncomfortable. Like you're not the only one who's there feeling a little awkward. You know, some might be natural or have been there several times, but you're not the only one who feels like this is awkward. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I actually wrote in the back of my book, I have like a startup glossary because one of my like more awkward moments was going to pitch contests in these different events and hearing people talking about cap tables and all of this stuff. And I'm like, I have no idea what they're talking right. about. They so I was like, here's a little like crib sheet. So if you at least have the jargon down, you know, it's going to be a little bit easier to put your best heel forward and, and introduce yourself and, col- and connect with people. And also the idea too of getting with people who aren't necessarily your friends is something I, cause I have friends who are, I'm very close to tons of them, which is great from uh, college, but they're not entrepreneurs. So the, the, Stress is a little bit different, not better or worse, because they have children. So Absolutely. there's that. Everything's, you know, di- everything's different, but it's it's just a different. So getting around other women entrepreneurs and having those conversations, as you said, is important. And I'd like to dispel the mean girl myth. Um, mm-hmm. I think I had thought it was there in women in business and especially women entrepreneurs. Um, the instant I reached out as I needed to interview women for for Elegant Entrepreneur, I intended to do three interviews. Each woman I talked to was really excited about the project and about more women starting up, and they introduced me to two or three other women. And so I ended up with 28 interviews and delaying the release of the book to weave them all in. So it's not a mean girl society. Literally everyone helps everyone, especially women entrepreneurs. And it's it's a really cool uh, group to be a part of. Yeah, and I think it's so wonderful, too, just to see how much it's growing and then women and that women entrepreneurs are taking it upon themselves to help the community grow. I really feel like we've hit a tipping point. Like there was the glass ceiling in corporate America. And I feel like entrepreneurship had this sticky floor where women just like couldn't quite make that that leap. And they don't have to make that leap. They just need to make a step. And so I think everyone's doing their best. There's all sorts of interesting hackathons and programs and books coming out to get more women to start up because we make amazing entrepreneurs. And do you think sharing the, your story, or for all of us, sharing your story too is such an important part of it, especially like you said, the sort of icky stuff. You didn't say icky. I'm saying <laughs> icky, but the icky <laughs> stuff. So um, I had, so I've obviously never written a book before. <laughs> Um, And so the first draft of the book had very little of my story in it. And as I sent it out to to editor and, you know, I had a collective group of of friends and venture capitalists and all these different people reading it, they're like, where are you in this book? Mm -hmm. And I realized, well, I just wanted to create this guide. And they're like, no, your story is important. Like women like you who are doing, you know, who don't have an MBA, who don't have a business background, who've never taken a marketing class can be inspired by the fact that you figured it out and here's how to do it and here's real life examples. So I had to go back through and put in all of those different bits and pieces and I'm kind of a private person and so there's this give and take on that but I'm really glad I did it and um, it's really cool to get emails or tweets or messages on Facebook where people were like, I love this example and thank you for sharing that. Like this happened to me and so yeah, I sort of lifted the veil on yes, it's not always pretty. We're not always put together. We all fall down and we all stand up again kind of a deal right and it's your story that is the thing in addition to the great information that you provide that people really connect to yeah so it's sort of like a third how-to business book a third my personal journey and then a third advice and really cool stories from amazing women entrepreneurs so it's like like I said sort of the formula for the book that I was always looking for I love that. And it's called Elegant Entrepreneur. I'll make sure we link to it. And it's a bestseller on Amazon, right? Yeah, it's the a bestseller in the startup category, which is amazing and exciting. And cross your fingers. I'd love to be, you know, in the best bestseller category for women in business because that would make a lot more sense. You will be. We're going to hold that intention for you. I love that. Now, what's the greatest lesson having a business has taught you about yourself as a woman? She who dares wins. You have to dare to have the idea and then you have to dare to take the next step of validating that idea and you have to dare to tell your story and dare to do something you're uncomfortable doing and unsure if you can do. And every time you have those little bursts of courage, even if they're tiny, like 20 second bursts, something good happens. And so what I have learned is you have to be brave and you have to be daring and you will be rewarded. I love that. And what do they say? 20 seconds of courage. Sometimes it's all it takes in the moment, right? 
Right. I love that. Now, what does your support network look like in your life and in your business? So uh, my husband is also an entrepreneur and incredibly supportive. And so a lot of people space their children every two years. We try to space, um, we have one son together. Um, We try to space children and uh, our our companies two years apart to be supportive (laughs) of each other because having both partners with startups is like both partners having newborns. And so um, he's incredibly supportive of the book. He was like, you know, you should do this. If you don't do this, who will? And like, if, if you don't write this, how many women just like you won't start businesses? So he's been great. My parents are very supportive. I have a very tight circle of close friends that um, have been there from the very beginning, have known me, um, you know, from high school, from college and onward. And then I have this new circle of entrepreneurial women, some of whom I just aspire to be like someday that have sort of taken me under their wing. And so um, it's a very multi-layer support system. And it's quite cool. Was your husband an entrepreneur when you met him? Yes, he was. Okay. Do you think it was, well, certainly a, a part of it, just him having that mindset and saying, you should do that. Yes, was that it- absolutely helped. Um, although he had a manufacturing company that was like, uh, 13 years in. So it was a very different sort of thing than a, than an online startup, but just that, you know, he, and he does have an MBA. So like having him to bounce ideas off of and to, you know, sort of help validate some of the things I was trying to do was incredibly helpful. So now what's next for you? What are you excited about now? I know you space things out every other year. But <laughs> <laughs> is, is this a, is, is 2017 one of the years of something new? What are you I up think to? so. I've been doing a lot more speaking lately. Um, like it was at World Bank and just, I've been doing, I don't always love to speak. I love one-on-one speaking, but I find when it's a group of women, it's really exciting for me to talk to them and engage them and help them understand the power of ideas or, you know, how entrepreneurship works as a woman. Um, I also have, and I actually have written a children's book for entrepreneurship. It's just a matter of finding an illustrator to get that out the door. <laughs> oh, that's great. Do you need some um, recommendations for I illustrators? Do. I do. I'll email you some Please. names. Oh, that would be awesome. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's literally, it's written, it's done. Um, like I said, I have a little boy and he was like trying to read my book and it was super sweet. And I was like, you know what? There's all of these books for kids on like, you know, like alphabet books on like construction. We own that book. I'm like, why isn't there an intro entrepreneurship book at the child level? I love so that. I wrote that. And then I also did an audio book of Elegant Entrepreneur with the mission to donate it to aspiring women entrepreneurs around the globe. So there are women in accelerators in Pakistan, in Qatar, in the Philippines, in um, Peru, all over that um, because they don't have a computer, it literally is a link that they get and they push it on their phone and it just starts playing the book. So wow, I'm really. Now how does that work? Where do people go to get that for people listening in other countries? So anybody in another country, just email info at elegantentrepreneur.co and say, hey, I'm from XYZ and I would love to, to get access to the audiobook. And um, we'll make a custom, a custom link, host it in Amazon for you and your incubator or accelerator or your women's entrepreneur group. And then you can share it. And I'm hoping to make a ripple effect because women invest about 90% of their income back into their families and communities as opposed to men. And I think it's like 37%. It was in Forbes. And so... If we can empower women around the world to start businesses and inspire their children, I think there's going to be a huge change in, in the world and in, in women's, women's advocacy everywhere. And that's so true. And they say when you either educate a woman, you educate her whole community, her family, and it just, as you said, has that ripple effect. So yeah, that was, that was something very cool that I really wanted to do. So yeah, I'm excited that that's, that's rolling out and going pretty well. Now people can get the book on Amazon, right? You're Yes, it's a paperback, it's a uh, Kindle book, it's also an audio book, all on Amazon. Great, I will have links to everything. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you so much for your time. I have, a, you, I mean, such great information within these few minutes. It's been great to have you. Just a couple more questions for you. If you think over your life and career, and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? I think it would be my my Southern grandma, Mary Louise, um, for always believing without a shadow of a doubt in whatever 
ideas I had from my childhood onward. She was just an advocate of you can absolutely do it. Even if nobody else thinks it's a good idea, you should at least try it. Southern grandma. I love Southern grandma. My, <laughs> my family's from Alabama, so I know that. Okay, she's in, she was in Tennessee, so yeah. yeah. I love that feeling. So what can we do to support you? Is there anything? I know we're going to have the book. We know about the recording and all these great things. What else can we do to support you? You know, I have a, a female founder blog at elegantentrepreneur.co. So if you want to read inspiring stories, little bits of advice, um, just anything that catches my attention or inspires me ends up on that blog. And then also um, I'm on Instagram as Elegant Entrepreneur. And there's always inspirational quotes and little video snippets to just sort of help gear you up and give you insight and get you through your day and through, through your business. Now, for people who are interested in you, say, coming to speak at events, you said you're doing that more now. Uh, what is, is there a place to, because it's not on Miss Now, Mrs. Is no, it's, it's also at elegantentrepreneur.co. There's a speaker page and a contact me box. And uh, okay. yeah, I really, I really enjoy it. And it seems to be something that people are inspired by. So absolutely. Um, International Monetary Fund, I didn't realize, sent a survey. <laughs> after my presentation because it was part of a, a women's entrepreneurship series and um, they were like you were by far everyone's favorite and I looked at like the lineup and everyone else had so many m more credentials but apparently I was the most relatable and and engaging kind of a thing so that was really great feedback to receive and it makes me feel good to help other people right and it's awesome it's probably too because I imagine when you're speaking you share your story Exactly. I'm not saying, oh, you know, according to the textbook of this, that, and the other, like, here's what you should do. I can be like, you know what, I did this and it was a huge disaster. I should have done this and maybe, you know, here's some stuff for you to do. Right. People and then like I'm still in it. I'm still running a business and still continuously finding new social media tools and things to make life better and faster as an entrepreneur and as a woman and as a mother. Right. So now what's a parting piece of advice that you have for our listeners? Not that you haven't given us tons of fantastic advice. So my favorite quote of all time is, failures are opportunities in disguise. And so it sounds really trite when you're having a bad day or something really awful happens. But if you stop and think about it, I failed to become a doctor and I would never have become an entrepreneur if I hadn't exp experienced that failure. I failed to change my name. If I hadn't experienced that failure and found an opportunity in it, I would never have started Miss No Misses. I failed to find the book that I wanted to help me start my business and grow as an entrepreneur. And if I hadn't found the opportunity, I would never have written Elegant Entrepreneur. So not, not to over iterate on that, but it's so true. So we all have failures, although we don't talk about them very much. Think about it. Like, I mean, it hurts, have that big emotion. And then look at it and figure out what can I learn from this? Is there an idea in this? Is there a way to pivot this into some sort of massive success? Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Thank you so much, Danielle. I so appreciate you. So happy to have you and have you be able to share your story with us in addition to your tips. Well, thank you. And I, I'm an avid listener, so I'm excited. <laughs> it always makes me happy when you have a new podcast. up. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Hold on just one second. All right. Thank you so much for listening to that episode of the Support is Sexy podcast. And I do hope that you got some inspiration from it. And the challenge is for you to do at least one thing. Take one thing from the episode, at least one thing. You can always do more, but at least one thing that will help you move one step closer to your dream. Whether that's launching a business, writing a book, whatever that thing is that you want to do, take something from this episode and move one step closer. And what I'll also ask of you, if you can tell me what you think about the episodes, what we've been doing, what you want to hear what you like, what you experience while you're listening, go over to iTunes, leave us a review and let me know what's going on. What are you thinking? What are you feeling about the show? What else can I do to be of service to you, which is what this is all about, to be of support to you. That's our buzzword, right? You can also go to our website, supportissexypodcast.com. That's supportissexypodcast.com. Hear more episodes there. Also have a bunch of great videos, tons of information. It's where I'm going to be spending a lot of time and it's where I love to connect with you. So again, thank you so much for listening. I truly appreciate you and your support. And the most important thing I want you to remember is having it all does not mean doing it all alone. So now go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.